Hi, uh, my name is Ashish Majmundar. I'm a Principal Solutions Architect in Global Financial Services. And uh, with me is John. Thank you so much for coming this uh, afternoon. Uh, we trust this will be a beneficial time for you all. Thanks, Ashish. Hi, I'm John Kane. I'm a Business Development Manager in our Financial Services Organization. And I focus particularly on the capital market segment. Um, and in today's session, if we can kind of leave three things with you. Um, it will be first, regulatory reporting is a challenging application uh, in the financial services industry. And it's one that's becoming more complex as regulatory uh, mandates continue to change and evolve, just making that more challenging. And it's not just a challenge from a technical perspective in delivering reports or data to the regulator, but it's very much creating a process that's audible, repeatable, and can be sustained through operational issues no matter how infrequent they occur. And so today's session will walk through an architecture that can be generically used for regular reporting challenges in general. The ability to take various forms of semi-formatted data, ingest that, normalize it, and then use that for reporting and analytics. But for today's session, we have a demonstration that's specifically focused on upcoming regulatory changes that are related to the Consolidated Audit Trail, or SEC's new mandate for broker-dealers in the United States to report their transactions to the regulators for market surveillance. And so we'll actually do an implementation of Ashish's architecture specifically related to the challenges that come along with the implementation of CAT. Now, so today's agenda, I'll provide a little bit of an overview on the reg reporting space in general, some of the challenges from an application perspective, but also some of the regulatory changes that have occurred, particularly in the transaction reporting space. We'll give an overview of the consolidated audit trail. It's the basis of today's demonstration, and therefore we'll give you a sense of not just what it does, but sort of the data that's involved, and sort of the timing and the reporting to the regulators. Ashish will walk you through the architecture involved, hitting on the key design elements, how we've implemented them specifically to address these issues, and give a demonstration of its actual implementation in an AWS environment. At the end of the session, I'll do a quick recap, and then we'll open up the floor to questions. So reg reporting covers a lot of topics in the industry, because certainly not only capital market firms have to report to the regulators, it certainly occurs across banking and insurance. And by reg reporting, we really mean any time that you have to share data with your regulators. Now, that is a large and complex challenge for a global financial firm. They face off against a universe of regulators, all who want data in different formats, at different frequencies, using some but not all of the same data elements as their kind of fellow regulators. And those mandates are constantly changing. So there's a cottage industry inside of financial services just to build solutions that respond to regulatory demands. Now, in our case, we're really looking at the changes that are occurring on the transaction side. Now, we're, financial services is a highly regulated industry, and I don't think sometimes we appreciate how much data we actually share with regulators. And now it's everything from financial statements, you know, shareholdings, your loan portfolio, how it's divided up among consumers, even your capital stress tests. And those things occur infrequently, require a lot of effort to report and generate and report to the regulators. Um, but what we're really focused on today is all the changes that are going on in the transaction reporting space. Over the last few years, regulations have changed dramatically in the amount of data that we have to share with regulators, particularly when it comes to trading activity during the day. Now, we saw under Dodd-Frank and ESMA that we have to report derivatives trades in real time up to the regulators with some extra information at the end of the day, and that was a step. And then when MIFID II dramatically increased the amount of information provided to regulators in EMEA for not just listed transactions, but also attempts to deal voice conversations um, as well as related derivatives transactions. And that was, you know, a 10x increase in the amount of information shared. We now have FINRA requiring the reporting of U.S. Treasury transactions to trace in a real-time basis. And next summer for broker-dealers, the consolidated audit trail hits, which is a large expansion of how we surveil the equity markets and how much data is actually being reported to regulators. But as these regulatory mandates come out, the volume of data that has to be reported and the number of fields that we're reporting are ever increasing. And the challenges we have legacy infrastructure 
within the industry that's not really designed to handle these types of changes. Now, when we look at how the industry has grown up, it's not surprising that we have things that are highly siloed. It used to be that equities was a completely separate business from fixed income, which is separate from your derivatives trading. That even if you're in the same organization, you might get that better, but so many financial firms are actually you know, made out of a consolidation of multiple financial firms into one. And these silos don't have a common format across infrastructure to represent the data the same way. They use different ETL processes and different data dictionaries. They don't represent transactions in the same manner from silo to silo. And so when you have to build out an infrastructure report to the regulator, you end up having to build another layer of data stores underneath that to pull in the data that you want, transform it, and then provide it to the regulator in the format that they want. Each of those silos has to scale to the worst case. So your existing data store in your equities universe has to be as big as the worst equity day, but then anything that's going to report both equities and options has to be big as both of them combined. So it's a large amount of transaction infrastructure that you have to build out for infrequent and occasional use. And then because it's not one organization using that data, keeping track of changes upstream that affect downstream reporting to regulators and then having to fix it later on is an incredible challenge. And so while this infrastructure works today, and there's a large amount of the industry focused on doing this correctly on a day-to-day -day basis, it's terribly complex and somewhat fragile. And as these new regulations come into place, it gives us the opportunity to relook at the infrastructure that we have to report against this and how we might be able to do it better. But before we can do it better, we have to appreciate sort of what makes reg reporting hard and what are the key things in an infrastructure necessary to support it. So first, like everything in the financial security industry, it has to be secure. And so it's almost redundant to say anything in financial services has to be secure because I think we already know that. But don't forget, this is transaction data. And for the firms that actually trade on the exchanges, this is the lifeblood of what they do. And it's probably some of the most sensitive information that they have, right? And sort of the potential for this to be exposed, horrific. So any architecture has to deal with security in a very fundamental layer, and it has to be the basis of any good design. Now, the other thing that's challenging about reg reporting is lineage. And when I say lineage, I mean the ability to actually look at a transaction flow from beginning to end and understand how each component ended up getting to the end result. So I need to be able to know what data I got in, how I transformed it, what the format and version of it was, where it went through the process, and what actually got delivered to the regulator. And that's not just from an operational perspective, right? Because you have to have confidence in what you're providing your regulator is accurate. So from an audit and operations perspective, it's helpful. But also when you have that issue with late or missing data, or code change and you don't have all the characteristics you thought you had in the data, you need to go be able to go back in a point of time and replay that information to make sure it's accurate as part of the regulatory reporting, even if you have to re-report at a later date. And I've been in situations where I've had to report data two or three years after the fact, and you may like, well, does anybody care? They do. Regulators ask for information that has, has been historic in the past, and when you make a commitment to a regulator, it has to be correct, and you have to make sure you can redo it. From the other challenge is there are so many data sources inside the financial services industries that represents the same thing, but are all slightly different. Um, I think recently looked globally, there's over 160 different formats for market data feeds, which are just basically bids, quotes, and asks, but we figure out how to do it at every exchange and every market. Even when we have things like FIX, an industry standard for transaction information, each exchange has its own version, its own custom tags, its own way of representing transactions that's a little bit different from everybody else. So that ETL process has to be well controlled and has to deal with a variety of formats. And then the data we're talking about is not insignificant. We're talking tens if not hundreds of millions of transactions that occur just in equities, just under the current system, not including any expansion that's envisioned. FINRA talks about having to transact 35 billion records a day. So the sheer volume of data we're talking about is pretty amazing. But what's even more challenging is the volatility of that data. Because that reporting has to work on a day when you have typical trading volume, or on a day like Brexit, where you have 10 times the typical trading volume, your systems have to scale and be able to deliver those reports on time. Otherwise, you have to deal with fines. It's one of the few areas where you get fined for doing your job poorly, even if you didn't do anything wrong. So you report data late, you miss reporting data, regulators do fine you for that. 
There's millions of dollars every year in fines that various regulatory agencies hit people for reporting transactions late or incompletely. Even if in the transaction data it doesn't say anything was wrong, the fact that it's late is a problem. And so as we go and implement an architecture to deal with these things, it unlocks other opportunities. So we can use reg reporting as an opportunity to unlock data within the enterprise once we solve these kind of core issues. So once you can transform a variety of unstructured data in multiple formats at scale into a data warehouse or warehouses, you can then open that up to various analytics. And whether it's just to support middle office, trading, P&L, portfolio exposures, or you can open it up for machine learning and statistical analytics, it allows you from a data officer perspective not only satisfy your needs for good governance and operations of data, but your desire to unlock that for financial benefit. So today's conversation, though, very much focused on the consolidated audit trail. Now, existing today, there is a system in place called OATS, where all firms, all broker-dealers, have to report to FINRA all their transactions at the end of the day. FINRA then looks at them and surveils them to see if there's any market misconduct, anything that goes on that may influence prices in an untowards manner. It violates the law. And that's a huge undertaking as it is. It's 35 million records that, you know, FINRA has to process. But despite that, after the flash crash and the financial crisis, the SEC didn't think that was enough information. They didn't think there was enough information in the existing 35 billion rows being processed by the industry today to have comfort that they could understand what was going on in the industry. And so what they've actually done is expanded the scope of what OATS covers. So no longer will you just report your equity trades. You have to report your equity option trades and how they're linked together. No longer does a broker-dealer say, this is my trades. They have to expose the customers that are behind those trades and give visibility to the regulators of who's driving the trades. And then if you're a firm that actually trades on behalf of multiple customers, you now have to report how those trades are allocated out to individual customers. And now all those things have to be linked together. So we're talking about now having to tie what are traditionally two different sets of data, equity and options data, together pulling in customer resource information into that data set, and then make sure it can link up to any allocation data our customers have. It's an overall revamp of what's being done today. And of course, it's a completely new standard and a completely new format for the data that has to be reported. So it's basically a redo of the entire reporting infrastructure for OATS today. And so just to give you a sense of sort of a very simplified overview of what we're talking about. So, Customers provide orders to their broker-dealers, either directly or to exchanges. The broker-dealers are then responsible for routing those orders to the appropriate exchange or to another broker-dealer. And if using one of the, the broker-dealer's algorithm, how that order is actually split up across multiple markets, the state of how that order is maintained, and then how it's finally either filled or canceled for the customer. And it has to maintain that record during the entire day. And so as trading activity occurs across multiple customers, the broker dealer is collecting up a sense of records that indicate the life cycle of each and every single order. Come the end of the day, the broker dealer needs to report all that information to the CAT consolidator, who's the industry facility who's responsible for kind of collecting all the industry across the all the information across the industry and providing it for kind of regulatory review. Now, the part of the demonstration we're going to focus on today is this end of day process where a broker-dealer takes their large RET set of fixed transactions, and we're going to assume for the sake of this demonstration, virtually all our post-trade information is in fixed. It's this industry standard format broadly used to report this type of information that we're going to ingest it into our infrastructure, normalize it, and then report out in a new format that meets the new consolidated audit trail specification. As part of that, we're going to do that transformation from what's fixed to the new standard, which is JSON. But we're also going to have to link those message states together and see how they tie together in an end-to-end -end solution. And just to kind of give you a sense for sort of the type of data that we're working with, um, if you're not familiar with fixed, somewhat industry standard, it's supposed to be kind of human readable. And if you do fix for a while, you can kind of get it. But essentially, it's a tag value format where each of the initial tags is actually, you look up in a data dictionary that tells you a little bit about the transaction. Each transaction type has its own messages and tags. And then we have to take that for a series of exchanges, all of which use slightly different versions of FIX, tie those together into an audit trail, and then convert it into JSON, which is actually the 
expected format for the consolidated audit trail reporting. And so in the demonstration, as she's about to walk you through, we're going to build an infrastructure that takes tens if not hundreds of millions of fixed messages, links them together, converts them into an optimized format, and then allows us to generate reports that we can send to the regulators. And that's all going to be done in a secure manner. It's going to scale to meet demand, and it's going to be cost effective. So Ashish, if you could talk us through the magic, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, cat reporting is um, definitely a challenge. But with the fit-for-purpose architecture and proper design, we can not only meet the challenges of the uh, cat reporting, but also use the data, the processing for additional benefits, like um, doing analytics on top of that. So CAD reporting is basically three stages. You've got ingestion, you've got transformation, and CAT reporting, the reporting and analytics to the right. So you see the, on the left, you have the orange ingestion. Blue, you have the transformation, which takes the data and puts it into the optimized format, and then the dual use cases that you see there using the same kind of architecture. CAT, the architecture for CAT reporting is going to be more than likely the difference between success and failure. Designing it properly is essential. If you have an architecture that cannot scale or even architecture that is not secure, uh, you will fail at this, uh, at this effort. Broadly speaking, you've got an architecture that processes over a billion messages, that is over three times the volume of your traditional uh, broker-dealer firm, high volume broker-dealer firm has to deal with. This architecture is designed for security. It's designed to handle lineage. And we're going to look at these components in a little bit more detail. The core services that are being used here, you see two sets of icons, one on the left and one on the right. Um, we'll talk about the icons on the left first. This is not the universe of uh, services that are used in this architecture. For instance, we don't have here SQS or Lambda. You might use that for automation. You might use an RDS, a relational database service, uh, for persisting things. You might use DynamoDB. Those are peripheral, not essential. Uh, but these core components are what you'll need to construct this architecture for the reporting. So let's start, start off on the left. You have uh, Direct Connect. That's your private connectivity from your on-premises environment to the AWS cloud. To the right, you have um, S3 and Glacier that forms our core storage in the cloud. It provides a highly uh, available, secure, durable um, storage. S3 is highly redundant. Glacier can be used for worm storage, write once, read many. And then we use CloudWatch and CloudTrail for monitoring the environment. CloudWatch, uh, you can have uh, the monitoring of operational and performance metrics. And then CloudTrail gives you that API level uh, detail on your entire infrastructure. And you have AWS uh, KMS, and it helps keep track of our keys, encryption keys. And then EMR, the managed Hadoop platform, for doing a bunch of the heavy lifting and batch processing. Amazon Athena and QuickSight are then used in combination uh, to present data visually. So Athena is the interactive query service, a serverless environment. And then that, in combination with QuickSight, lets you visualize the data beyond the needs of reporting. Now, to the right of this, you have uh, a blue icon, heard. Uh, you've probably not heard of it. It's no pun intended. But uh, it's um, uh, an icon that uh, represents the open source FINRA project. Uh, it, it keeps track of data in a unified format. It's a, a data cataloging and management platform. Now, in this architecture, security, as John mentioned, is absolutely essential. This architecture is designed to handle highly sensitive uh, data securely. We realize the importance of um, ex the uh, security right from the very beginning of the data flow all the way to the end. In addition to security of the data, 
uh, this architecture will also enable you to have complete control of the data by bringing your own keys from on-premises and bringing them to the AWS environment. You can use your uh, on-premises hardware security module to create the keys, and then you use those master keys to create uh, data encryption keys that are then used for encrypting the data. And then using standard AWS services like IAM, you can grant granular access control to the, uh, to the components that both use and transform this data. Throughout the entire process, not only do you have the controls for each of those components, but then you can track the auditing of those controls throughout the process. So security, if you look at security for, of the CAT reporting pipeline, it's essentially three main components. You have network isolation, you have encryption, and auditing. In terms of network isolation, you're quite familiar with the standard constructs of the Direct Connect, as I talked about a little bit earlier. You can also use an IPsec VPN tunnel over Direct Connect. And in terms of encryption, you have both the uh, data in transit and data at rest. Now, for data in transit, we use the transport layer uh, security cryptographic protocol for securing all communications. For data at rest, you have a couple of options. You can either encrypt the data on the client side, or you could encrypt the data on the server side. For client side encryption, you would be responsible for creating the 256-bit data key, and then supplying the key encryption key for all the services that you'll use in AWS. For server side encryption, AWS will encrypt the data for you, but there's multiple ways in which you can manage the encryption of that data. So you can have server side encryption that is managed by S3, for instance. In that case, S3 will manage both your master key as well as your data key. You can have server-side encryption with KMS, where you provide the master key, and then all the rotation and management of the keys is handled by uh, KMS. It, it creates the data key based off of your master key. And the third option is you can manage all the keys yourself, so customer-managed key, but server-side encryption. And all three options, you need to be very clear, AWS is actually encrypting the data for you, so you don't actually have to write any encryption or decryption programs. <clears throat> Auditing is essential here. So CloudTrail gives you that API-level calls uh, throughout your infrastructure. You can track um, who did what when based on the auditing of the um, KMS, which keys were used, when they were used, at what process, and CloudWatch you can set up alarms that trigger off certain actions, and then you can create Lambda functions to do further processing. So this, is, in, a, in essence, this is the security that you need to build to provide that platform for reporting. Now we're gonna look at a little demo of um, how to ensure that your data at rest is encrypted. It's one thing to just check off a box and say I want encryption on the server side. It's another thing to ensure that every datum that goes into that platform is actually encrypted. So what this is going to do is we're going to create a bucket. We're going to set up encryption for it. And then we're going to try and break that system. We're going to try and upload a file that is not encrypted and see what happens. So we're going to create a bucket here. Turn on versioning, and by default, we're going to turn on encryption, which is AES 256-bit. And then we're going to create a bucket policy. I had something in memory, copied and pasted that here. You're going to see it's just a few lines of code. And what you're seeing here is that this policy is going to deny any put object unless it has that header which says it's encrypted. All right, so the idea is you shouldn't be able to put anything into S3 into that bucket unless you have encrypted that data. So we're going to try now an unencrypted file and see what happens. You 
You can see at the bottom, encryption none. But we want encryption on the bucket, so what happens? You get an error. S3 will not allow that based on that bucket policy. But what if you tried that from a command line? Remember, you could go from a SDK or a command line. What happens? Does that change? So I'm going to try and copy something from my drive. Same thing. Access denied because you did not encrypt it. You did not provide that header. Now we're going to encrypt the file. There's your Amazon S3 master key encryption. So S3 is going to manage the encrypting of that data file as you upload it. And there it is. So with a few point and clicks, you're able to set up an environment that guarantees that every data in that bucket is encrypted. That's very important. Now, a secure framework is solidified with proper lineage. What is data lineage? John mentioned it briefly. Broadly, data lineage is also known as data provenance. It is tracking of the data from the origin, from the source, all the way to the end where it is consumed. It answers questions like, where was this data originated? Who touched the data? When was it touched? What changes were made? If any of you have worked with a Word document with review changes, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You have a whole bunch of folks looking at that document, and you review the changes, you know exactly what was changed, who changed it, what time, what comments they made, what they added, what they deleted. Well, we're just talking about the exact same thing in terms of data lineage, except it's talking about multiple data sets across an entire business. So that can be challenging. But capturing lineage has many benefits. You could ascertain data quality because of the lineage. You could track the source of errors. You can do root cause analysis. You can also replay scenarios, as John talked about. Regulators might want you to go back to a certain version of data and replay that. And then it allows you to do backward tracing and forward tracing. Backward tracing is looking at an operation and looking at all the inputs that went into it. Forward tracing is the converse of that, looking at an operation and looking at the outputs that come out of that particular operation. Now, lineage, when you talk about CAT reporting, needs to be addressed at two levels. First of all, the data itself, the data and the jobs themselves. So the versions of the data, the schemas, what jobs ran where, that's important. That's one level of tracking lineage. And the second level, from a regulatory perspective and an audit perspective, is the tracking of an order with all its life cycle events. What we're using here is, as I mentioned, HERD, the FINRA open source project for doing the lineage. You could also use GLUE, which automatically cat catalogs your S3 data. HERD is open source. It's in GitHub. It provides a unified data catalog. It captures both audit and data lineage information to fulfill the requirements of a highly regulated business. Now, the unified data catalog provides RESTful APIs so that you can uh, have publishers and consumers create new schemas, new versions, and register with HERD. It decouples the storage from processing. And what that means is that in a large environment, you could have a variety of tools. You could have a heterogeneous environment of different storage platforms, different processing tools. You don't need to tweak each one. You could have a centralized way of managing all that data across all those platforms by using HERD. It helps you keep track of not only the most current version of the data, but also as of a certain date. HERD also enables you to have centralized storage policies. So for instance, you might create a policy that says this particular bucket will have data for such and such, you know, such, and such a time, and after that time, it needs to move to infrequent access or to cold storage. You could put it off into Glacier. Now, think of the challenge of maintaining this kind of lineage in a large, distributed, dis uh, diverse environment. Who has used your data? When did they use it? 
The traditional way of doing that is to create multiple databases and then provide specific access, custom permissions and access permissions for restricting or granting access to certain databases, certain tables, by line of business and business unit. That gets very cumbersome. With Herd, you can keep track not only of your data and jobs, but also your publishers and consumers. Who's using that data? And when you start expanding your utilization of all the data that you're processing, you're gonna start getting into more and more derived data sets. And Herd can help you keep track of that as well. Another important feature of Herd is its shared Metastore. When EMR clusters start up, when they initialize, sometimes it could take a few minutes, especially if you have a large number of partitions. And you, it's not unheard of to talk about millions of partitions. With the shared Metastore in Hive, EMR clusters can point to them and come up rapidly. And when new versions of data are registered, new schemas are registered, the Metastore is automatically notified by SQS notification. So EMR clusters pointing to the shared Metastore can start up rapidly. The other advantage of using this Metastore is that, and I'm gonna show you in a, in a minute the demo, you actually define your domain objects, you define your data jobs in a simple XML format. Herd can then generate the DDL for you. Now the DDL can be used in a variety of ways across your business. Let's take a look at Herd in action. What you're going to see is a bunch of XML files that define the data. And you can imagine across a, a, a large business, several business units, creating tons of data jobs. They are responsible for defining that data job, that domain, what the data is, how much uh, data is there, what's the size, the row count, and it's a flexible and customizable API. You can add your own attributes to it. We're gonna send this using the RESTful API call over to Herd, and Herd will then persist that data. And then what we're gonna see is we'll be able to query, I haven't done the query in the demo, but you can just picture it. You can query that database, a simple Postgres uh, database, and run queries across your entire uh, lineage of a certain job or a certain counterparty or a certain symbol or a certain date. You can run all kinds of queries against that. So let's take a quick look at this demo. Here we're defining a data job, a data definition of the, in a certain namespace, this could be your line of business, and who is providing that data, in this case, exchange. Then you can add some further attributes to that job definition. Here we're partitioning on market code, just some random name. You could partition on something else. It shows you the path of where the data is. It's a gzipped file. What the size is, a little over 40 gig, and over 18 million rows. That's the job we're looking at. This is, you receive this fixed file, and now you're gonna process it. Here we're sending it through a RESTful API call, and we're piping it through XML so we can look at the output that's generated when the data is uh, inserted into Herd. The response comes back. You have all the details of the entire job. And as I mentioned earlier, this is customizable. You can add further attributes that your line of business might be interested in. Moving over from this, uh, 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 request that's sent over to Herd in, in a RESTful API. We're going to look on the server side. This is the master node, and Herd has a PostgreSQL database. So we're just going to look at the data we sent over via this RESTful API. And there you have it. It tracks it along with the file size, the attributes that you mentioned, the line count. And Herd has a plethora of tables for job, for data, for the business domain, and you can certainly add as much detail as you like. So the purpose of this demonstration, what I want you to take from this demo is that it is very easy for your entire business 
regardless of what the platform is in terms of storage of data, regardless of the tools that you're using for processing the data, to keep track and, and have the lineage across all your data. Now that we've talked about the foundational components of security and lineage, let's go through the data flow from left to right, which is ingestion, transformation, and reporting and analytics. This part of the architecture is responsible for ingesting raw fixed messages, raw messages that come from a bunch of uh, uh, counterparties perhaps, or um, it comes from the exchanges, company data specific data sets, and it deals with getting this data from on-premises into the AWS environment. S3 here serves as the data lake. It is the source of truth. You can automate end-of-day uploads via a cron job and do an S3 multi-part upload for best performance. Glacier can be used for vault locks, creating vault locks, to be in compliance with SEC Rule 17A4. And if you're not familiar with that, that rule basically outlines the necessity of retention and indexing and accessing the data. For immediate access, you have to maintain the data for two years. For non-immediate access, you need to uh, maintain it for a minimum of six years. And then duplicates have to maintain the same time frame. Now you can have a scheduled job that takes data from S3 buckets and moves into Glacier to be in compliance with SEC Rule 17A4. So here's, I'm gonna give you a demo on ingestion, how that's made easy. If you use the AWS SDK, you know it's a matter of creating a, a simple Java program, um, a matter of minutes, and you can set up your um, ingestion. There's a simple uh, process. You initialize it, you create the multi-part, and then you complete it. That code was all that was required for the multi-part. Here you're seeing the files coming in. We're gonna put it into the bucket of reInvent 27 FSV302 and we're gonna take that fixed data and put it in there. So now we've got a, a POM XML using Maven to execute a, a Java job for S3 upload. And this is an asynchronous process. Each of those upload parts are going asynchronously with, via thread, and there you have it. So what this is showing is that this particular uh, ingestion process can be made very simple. A simple Java program or a pro language that you prefer. And you, you can automate this end of day job, putting into a cron job, and your data gets, gets into AWS very easily. But once the data is in the S3 data lake, we've got to transform it. So this portion is going to focus on taking that data that's sitting in S3 as a source of truth, and then converting it into the format that is optimized for further processing. Here, we're gonna use EMR to go directly against S3. The goal here is to optimize the data not only for reporting, but also for analytics. We're gonna convert the data from fixed to parquet using EMR clusters. This is the heart of what makes this architecture highly efficient and able to scale to billions of messages. S3 serves as a data lake because it is highly redundant, it's infinitely scalable, and available for massive parallel access. This is a difference between having to copy data in HDFS and creating replicas everywhere. You're able to access all the EMR data that is sitting on S3 with multiple clusters at the same time. You have to create multiple uh, fit-for-purpose EMR clusters to perform this job. EMR clusters are used uh, for this transformation in either a transient way or in a permanent way. So you could have transient EMR clusters at the end of day when your job is finished, end of day billing, you, f you can shut down the EMR cluster. Or you could have an ongoing permanent EMR cluster that is awaiting new jobs. You can also have custom security configurations for your individual EMR clusters. This could be based on your business unit requirements. And then at the heart of an EMR cluster, you've got core nodes and task nodes. Core nodes and task nodes can also be customized based on the workload. 
So you might have um, a compute intensive job and you might use a C family of EC2 instances for that. Or you might have a Spark job. Spark jobs usually take a lot of memory. So with a Spark job, you might customize your EMR cluster to use some of those nodes as an R family of EC2 instance. In addition to that, you can auto-scale the EMR cluster. And John talked about the, the fact that you have to be able to scale perhaps in a market event, Brexit, and you have 10x volume or 100x volume. You don't anticipate that. You don't want to have that infrastructure up front. EMR clusters can auto-scale. Uh, scale out, and then the jobs Apache, Hive, Spark, Presto, they can automatically take advantage of the additional capacity. Not only do you scale out, but then you have to scale back in because you don't want to leave that cluster running. So the same kind of policy that you use for scaling out, you can create policies that scale back in. And also you can use spot instances to lower your cost. So we've got this data now by using Amazon EMR, converted fixed to parquet, and that's what it looks like, the performance of parquet, 488,000 uh, records scanned per second compared to the others. Now, you don't have to use Parquet. You can use any other compressed format. Uh, mileage may vary and often varies between reads and writes, so you have to choose the appropriate format. But the point is, you take this cluster and convert the data into a format that can be used later. Now, we're going to look at a demo that transforms fixed messages to JSON and to Parquet. You're going to see that this is relatively simple. Here have the same uh, Palm XML with a different execution goal. In this case, the input is a sample fixed message, multiple fixed messages, and then the output is a JSON format. So we're going to look at this file, and you can see that it is binary. See all those control characters in there. I'm going to take this and convert that to JSON. So we execute this, and you can picture doing this in an EMR cluster. It could be a Spark job. In this case, it's a simple standalone Java program. And there you have it. It converts it to the required format that the regulators require. We take a look at that, look at the output, and there's your output in JSON. How do we do this? Simple Java program. There's the code. It's I don't know, 20, 25 lines of code to convert. This is using Quick Fix J, the open source software, uh, to convert the um, fix from binary to JSON. Now, once you have it in JSON format, you can take it and convert it to Parquet. Here, you just need two lines of code. With Spark, you have uh, the data frames that uh, have been so beneficial to create great jobs in like two lines of code. You've taken uh, JSON, and with the simple data frame write to Parquet, converted that to Parquet. Now, once we have this data in the optimized format, we are ready for reporting and analytics. So this section is going to talk about the data that's already in S3, but now in a format that can be read by different tools. We can use both EMR as well as Athena to report off of the data. The EMR clusters running Spark and Hive and Presto can be used for more complex logic, and Athena can be used to query the data and write it back in another format. Now, even if the cat spec were to change, this does not impact us immensely because, you, as you see, there's a few lines of code, and you can change that. So it's the architecture that enables you to be nimble. Here's an Athena table. You create an external table. All you do is represent the data that's sitting on S3. Athena is schema on read. It's based on a schema on read, which, which means that the data residing on S3 is not impacted even if you were to delete the table that defines it. So they're independent. It's sort of, you think of it in terms of a view of how to look at the data. If the cat spec changes, delete the Athena table, create a new one, 
and, and you're ready to go. As you can see here, we're storing it in a parquet format using Athena instead of uh, EMR. So now that we have this data in a parquet format, we can actually do analytics on it. Amazon QuickSight can be uh, pointed to Athena, and you can retrieve the data from Athena and visualize it in a point-and-click fashion. Now think about this. What if you had a regulator that says, we want all the trades for the past five years that you have um, in your record for a particular firm? You might go back and look at your history table, and that's over nine terabytes of data. What, what would be your options? Well, first of all, you could have an option of maintaining everything online. You could say, we anticipate such requests coming from the regulators, and we're going to keep everything in a huge, massive database. But that would cost you, if you're using RDS for a year, that would cost you roughly $27,000. That's expensive. Well, option two, you could archive the data and upon request bring that data in to a database and then use some queries to run the data for a particular firm and send it off to the regulators. That's a lot of effort. You know the, the tedium of going to tape archives and getting data on premises and then reporting off of that. Well, there is a third option. You could use data at rest on S3 and use Amazon Athena or Amazon Redshift Spectrum to query the data. The difference between this is you could do the third option for around $45, scanning nine terabytes of data. And soon I'm gonna show you a demo of how long that would take to process that kind of data. So QuickSight then allows you to import data from multiple formats, uh, from multiple sources, S3, Athena, RDS, Redshift, Presto, Salesforce, Teradata from a file. There's a lot of sources, and I'm sure they're going to add more. Here's a simple output from a quick site point and click. You could ask questions of the data, which of my customers are trading above or below the trend. You could ask which ones are having challenges in their P&L, or you could ask which product is being traded the most by which firm. So let's put Athena and QuickSight into action. We're going to have a quick demo. We're processing over a billion messages, and this is data pointing to S3. So that count star from the table And there you have it, 1.157 billion rows. And it took two minutes and 20 seconds to do that. Now let's scan 740 gig using SQL. Here's a simple select query. You select a few things from the table. And we're grouping by, you notice there's no where clause. So this is actually going to scan the entire data set. And this process took two minutes and 25 seconds and it scanned 740 gig of data. Now, if you try and do that in a traditional database environment, that you know that that's expensive, that's difficult, sometimes impossible. Once you have the data, you're ready for point and click um, analytics. You point Athena, uh, QuickSight to Athena. You create a new analysis. There are some of the options. I've got a parquet format. And by the way, John mentioned that you could have multiple formats. Here I'm using a fixed ML format instead of the binary fix. Add the attributes that you're interested in. QuickSight will automatically visualize the data in the appropriate format. As you keep adding new attributes, it changes that automatically. And there you have, within seconds, a point-click analysis of all your data. Which counterparties, which products, which symbols, the dates, volumes, whatever you have put in your query, you're able to visualize that. 
Another feature here is that you could take this data and then create filters on it. And by creating filters, you can hone in on certain counterparties. You could hone in on certain products or symbols. And these, this is all fictitious data. It's not meant to represent any firm. It's all generated. So there you have it. You can compare now at the top multiple counterparties across various attributes. Well, Qu QuickSight is both powerful and convenient because it's a managed service, but you don't necessarily have to use QuickSight. You can use any of your existing tools to, to perform this. And we have a variety of uh, partners that you can use. You probably have your own uh, visualization tools on premises. The point is that we create this architecture in such a way that it is reusable, not just for reporting, but also for analytics. It's in the format. You're already doing the work, so you may as well leverage that for additional benefits. John? Thanks, Shish. Sure. So when we talked at the beginning of the presentation, what were the key aspects we needed from an architecture? Um, first one, we talked about security, and I think Shish has shown you in a framework that covers the core elements, right? It addresses encryption of data, both in REST and in transit, restricts access to that data from that network isolation, and then applies both bucket policies and IAM rules to restrict access to the data, and sets up an audit trail about data access. So it ticks the box there. Next one we talked about was lineage. And by using S3 and landing all the data in S3, as, um, using it as a data lake, it gives us that original data that we can always work against and begin that trail of lineage from that original ingestion into S3 out to report it to the regulator. By architecting around Herd, he was able to create metadata that showed when that data was being transformed each step of the process and kept track of which version of software and of data was being used in that process. We addressed the volume concerns through using EMR to ingest that data. EMR gives us the ability to automatically scale up to whatever data challenges we needed. So we could kick off jobs at the end of the day when that data was available, and EMR would scale up to address the demands that we had to transform that data. Each EMR cluster could have a different parser, and so what we did certainly with FIX, it's not just related to FIX. You could have different parsers parse different types of data. So even outside of the CAT demonstration, Overall, that ingestion architecture works for a variety of reg reporting uses. And then certainly once that data has been normalized, it unlocks a large number of reporting and analytic solutions that can be done on top of it. So it addresses our core need of actually having to report out to the regulator, right, sort of the core basis. But then that data is now available to data scientists and business intelligence folks inside the firm to leverage that data for a greater variety of uses. And because both from an EMR perspective, they're only scaling when we need to um, and scaling down when we don't. It's cost efficient. And then by using S3 as our source of historic data, when we have infrequent access like regulatory requests or even when we want to do ad hoc analysis on historic data, we can do that without keeping it in a database. And by using Athena or Redshift, we get a very cost effective way to actually manage the data that's in that environment. And so hopefully today we've covered sort of all those key characteristics that we said we were going to address in a regulatory reporting architecture. We still have a few minutes left in the session. We have two mics on both sides of the stand. If there's anyone who has questions, we're kind of happy to take them now. 